Now we're going to look at buckling for the different types of columns. So I kind of made a video on where, like, what happens if you have a pin at the top and the bottom, just to kind of go through all the math. But now we're going to kind of look at, well, what happens whenever we have other types of stuff. So let's look at this one where we have like some force here and we've just got a free column. So we just got like an obelisk or something with a bird sitting on it. All right. And then it's free. So the top end can wiggle and the bottom is fixed. We are going to measure X coming up, I think. Let's do from the bottom. Okay. So let's see. What do we got here? So we've got, um, let's kind of look at the top section. So let's pretend we're just going to kind of exaggerate the buckliness of it. Okay, so we've got our P force here. And let's say that this distance um, from where it's supposed to be, we'll pretend it's supposed to be here. Or not there, let's pretend it's supposed to be further away. Ah, oh, come back. There, like that. So that's where it was kind of supposed to be, and now it's kind of bent. So we'll do this little itty bitty delta here and um, this little itty bitty, maybe I can make this a little bit more exaggerated for you. I feel like that. I should so not ever be in charge of drawing anything ever. Okay, so this is our deflection right here. Okay, um, and then we're going to do the thing like we did in statics where we have a reaction force and a reaction moment. Okay, so the reaction force, there's going to be no, so there's this one, the shear is zero. There's going to be the reaction normal is going to be P, and then the reaction moment, and then X, and that's what we're going to be interested in. Okay, so a couple of things. If, so if this little delta over here is greater than the displacement, then the moment is going to be negative. And if this ends up being greater than the um, displacement, then the moment is positive. Okay, but anyway, let's do um, some math. So let's take the moment about that little point right here, this little point, derp, 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 that point. Okay, so the moment about scribble, apparently, which is what we're doing, what about scribble? Derp, derps. Um, we've obviously got the reaction moment there. So M is a function of X, and then we're going to subtract off whatever um, the moment is. So again, it's either going to be positive or it's going to be negative. Um, so I'm just going to write that in as um, P uh, delta minus the displacement, and that will achieve uh, that right there. All right, so I'm able to come up with the moment is given by P times delta minus V. All right, and that's good because that takes care of the, if it's this, then it's positive, and if it's that, then it's negative thing. All right, I'm gonna do the same thing that I did last time, which was to um, throw this in here with the M, E, not M, <laughs> with the EI, EI times the D squared, V, D, X squared, um, and then I'll throw this back over there, I guess, in the other direction. So minus, or just say equals, P this minus but up, but up. Okay. So I'm going to organize some things a little bit differently. I'm going to go, so I'll just call that V double prime plus E I, uh, let's say times, derp, 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 derp. oh, divided by, why am I multiplying? P divided by EI, V is equal to P delta over EI. So now remember last time <laughs> I had a homogeneous second order ODE, and now I have a non-homogeneous second order ODE. All right, so again, we're going to do the thing with the R squared plus P E I V R to get our homogeneous solution. And then we need to get our particular solution and add them together and blah, blah, blah. So we'll pretend that you know differential equations because theoretically at this point, that's where we should all be. Um, and that allows us to say, okay, that our displacement is going to be given by. So we've got this um, first constant. Um, and it's going to look very similar, P over E, I, with the X out front, forgot that. And then the C2, sine, nope, <laughs> cosine, with the X out front, and the square root in there, P over E, I, and then our lovely little particular solution sticking off there at the end. 
<sighs> okay, now we're going to go look and find our um, initial conditions. So based on our initial conditions, um, it's fixed at the end. So at x equals 0, we know that v equals 0. Okay, and also at x equals 0, uh, dv dx is equal to 0. So we did that as like this before. So the dv dx is equal to 0. All kinds of fun. And um, so I'm going to go apply that here. So I have at x equals 0, v equals 0, and at x equals 0, dv dx equals 0. And let's just say that y'all can do diffy q. And so what that's going to tell us is that C2 is equal to negative 8 and C1 is equal to 0. That gives us the equation that the displacement for this particular problem is going to be that delta times the 1 uh, minus cosine P over EI with the X out front like this. Whew! All right, this is all kinds of fun. Okay. Now, uh, one more thing that we can look at, because um, we still have that stupid delta thing, is we can say, okay, well, at L, if x is equal to L, at x is equal to L, v is equal to that delta, right? Because that's, that's what that is. <laughs> if x is equal to L, v is equal to that delta, and so we can shove that in there. So that means that um, v is equal to, well, Let's put it this way. So that would mean that um, this cosine P, no, not X, this cosine of L um, times P over EI would have to be equal to zero. Okay, so at X equals L, V equals this implies that. So the same logic as before, this happens when the P over E I square root e thingy L is equal to, now whenever cosines are zero, cosines are zero at the 90s, right? Um, or not at the 90s, but the 90 and the, the 270, okay? So basically um, the cosines are gonna be zero at pi n over two, where n is an element of the integers. Okay, so we're gonna get the same thing, except before when we were doing it in the previous video, the signs were what was getting, um, to zero, and now it's the cosines that are getting to zero. So now we would say, again, doing the same stuff as we did before. I can't spell critical. Critical. So now when you do the exact same process, the, 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 the critical, the critical load comes out to being something like uh, pi squared EI over 4L squared. Okay, so I'm going to show you those two side by side so you can kind of take a look. Okay, so looking at these two side by side, so what you see is if it's pinned at the top and the bottom, this is the critical load. If it's fixed at the bottom, this is the critical load. So you'll see that these values here are exactly the same thing, but this dude here has a one-fourth. So a fixed column can actually only support one-fourth of the other load. Like this is like a, a, an inefficient sad, this is sad panda column and this is happy pumpkin uh, column. This dude over here um, can actually support four times as much of the load as the other dude because he's um, on the top and the bottom. Now you might think, well, it's fixed instead of, or it's pins, so you'd almost kind of feel like the pins would be like less strong, but it's the combination of the two pins that actually makes it stronger than just one fixed end. So that's what gets us to the whole concept of effective length. Okay, so the idea behind the effective length is the distance between the two zero moments on a column. So like in this one up here that we were looking at, there is a zero moment right here and there's a zero moment right here, okay? So the idea is that um, the entire uh, column, if it's pinned at the top and the bottom, is considered effective. Like I'm appreciating all of the links that are going on here, so if it's pinned, and pinned, the effective length is the entire length of what's going on. Now on the thing where it's just pinned in one place, because it can go like this, nope, not like this, um, it can literally just bend, then the places between um, 
the two zero moments on a column, I would actually have to completely um, go all the way down this way and mirror it and say, okay, well then it's uh, effective length here really is all of that. The effective length is, um, well, why did I put the little equal sign there? The effective length right here is twice the total length. Okay, so um, you kind of get the same thing where if you're fixed on the top and the bottom, you can kind of say, oh, it's going to look like this, kind of. So the two zero moments would be like right here. So your effective length where you're pinned at the, not pinned, but where you're fixed at the top of the bottom is one half L. And just in case you care, um, this is something you'd actually have to do the math on, but um, to get the effective length for something that's just say pinned on the top, it's going to look kind of like this. Um, the effective length ends up being um, 0.7 times the length. Okay, um, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. Now what's funny though is that we will look at um, the effective length where we, what we really really care about is the the ratio of the effective length so I'll write this the ratio of the effective length to the total length you can't see that so that's that k value is what we're looking at here so in this case the k would be equal to effective length over actual length is just one so the k here is one if you're pinned at the top and the bottom. Okay, then here the k would be the effective length over the length. So here the the ratio is two. Here the ratio is going to be the one half l over l, so the ratio is going to be one half. And here the ratio is 0.7 l over l. So again, k here is 0.7. So it's these ratios um, that we're kind of paying attention to, um, and. Uh, like this. Okay, so how this all goes with our critical um, thing. So like remember here, um, the k value is 2. So it's basically 1 over k squared. Okay, and then here our k value is 1, so that 1 over k squared still works. And I know that saying, look, it works for these two examples, therefore it works for everything, isn't really how math works. Um, but it can at least give you the idea that for the critical, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have to put in that k squared. Okay, and then, yeah, we'll do that. Critical, critical, critical. Yay! Okay. So that means that in general, um, if we have the critical load, it's going to be that pi squared e i over um, l squared but then times the one over k squared out front. And then this could apply, so basically the idea is we could have a table that has all these different k values, and then we would be able to move forward with that. Now in um, another video, again, we um, plugged in, let me see, to get the uh, critical stress, um, we did the p critical over the area, um, and so, we went in and we said, oh, okay, so we've got um, the P critical squared E I K squared L squared <laughs> over area, except we replaced the I with a R squared with the radius of gyration, and we made these go away. And then we divided by the, the, the thingy, the L and the R thingy down there at the bottom. So um, I guess the point is we could rewrite this as this over KL divided by R squared. Okay, so I'm just going to rewrite that a little bit prettier. So the critical stress is the pi squared E over KL over 2 quantity squared. And just like in the other example, we talked about that as being the uh, slenderness ratio. When we have the K on it, it's called the effective slenderness slenderness ratio. Okay, so the effective slenderness ratio um, is what you would do based on how your beam is supported on either end. And a lot of design codes are going to call for an effective length factor. And so that's kind of how one of the steps that you take in, in putting all this together in the real world.